Oxford University has a distinguished place in the story of science. With the birth of modern science in the 17th century, but today, many people think that God and science clash inevitably, and the issue is often controversial. Is this universe a closed system, or isn't it? The real conflict is not science. Firstly, it's a misconception of God. Seeing is only one part of evidence. Can science understand love? Not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science. Is it really true that science has abolished God? Has science really made God irrelevant? To explore this tension, I met with John Lennox, Oxford professor of mathematics, who's entered this debate and become a key voice in all the discussions. We met at St Ebbs Church in Oxford. John, you're from Northern Ireland, which is a tiny spot on the earth, but it's produced great thinkers like C.S. Lewis and like yourself. How did you get into science and have such a love for it? What does it mean to you today, all these years later? Well, I got into science, I think, probably because I had very good mathematics teachers at school, and I found I was moderately good at it and so on. And I was very fortunate. You say it's a tiny country, and it has produced great people like C.S. Lewis, but it also has produced a lot of sectarianism and so on which has made its reputation in terms of Christianity fairly negative. And that's another interesting thing, because my parents, who did not have my education, I was the first to go to university, they were Christian without being sectarian. Mm. And that was the first amazing thing. I didn't realize how unusual that was mm -hmm. until much later. And secondly, they allowed me to think. So when I arrived in Cambridge in 1962, I wasn't saddled with all the sectarian baggage that many of my contemporaries had. And C.S. Lewis, as you mentioned, was still at Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And I was able to go and listen to the very last lectures he ever gave. But before I got to Lewis's lectures, something happened in my college that really sent a compass bearing for all of this. Uh, it was very early on. And a student at dinner said to me, do you believe in God, John? And then he said, oh, sorry, I should never have asked an Irishman that question. All you Irish believe in God and you fight about it. <laughs> well, I'd heard it before, but the point was I thought, now I've got a real chance at Cambridge to meet people who don't share my worldview, who'd never been to church, who mm -hmm. don't have Christian parents and so on. And I made a deliberate decision then, and I'm so glad I did, to get to know people and befriend them who were atheists, agnostics, and so on. I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. And that became a guiding idea, I think, because I felt I want to be certain, but also I want, with God's help, to help other people to mm -hmm. come to certainty. And I'll never be able to do that unless I really mm -hmm. understand what the other views are, particularly the atheist and agnostic view, and, uh, and no, so it's on people, so not arguments. Yeah. That's right. And what I discovered was, the more I exposed myself to people in friendly, you're absolutely right, discussion, the more I became, in that sense, vulnerable and open to questioning, the more my faith in God grew. Mm -hmm. And having done this, you see, that took me to um, Eastern Europe and uh, during the Cold War. There I was able to at first hand get to know a state, East Germany, where I could speak the language. Uh, that was systematic atheism in the education system. And after the wall fell, I went to Russia, the same reason, talking about these things in the Academy of Sciences and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, modern science, of course, well, science goes all the way back to the Greeks and was partly kept alive by the Muslims, but modern science, its matrix was the Reformation. 
modern science was born in a Christian framework. And indeed, C.S. Lewis, who as usual puts it brilliantly, said, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. Now Alvin Plantinga, the great Christian philosopher, says the real conflict is not science, the conflict is philosophy. Oh yes, he's dead right. Plantinga has seen what other people have seen, and it's, it's a major point, it seems to me, in this. The way in which the new atheists and atheists in general present to the public is the big conflict is science versus God mm -hmm. and science has won. I want to say no, it's a worldview conflict. It's on the level of philosophy. And what I mean by that is very simple. If you go back to the ancient Greeks, which you mentioned earlier, you have two dominant views barreling up from the ancient world. One is the view of Democritus and Leucippus that reality, ultimate reality, is atoms in the void. And the atoms pour through the void, they create a universe, worlds, planets, life, consciousness, all the rest of it, you mm -hmm. see, and the idea of God, because there isn't a God. Mm -hmm. The other worldview, which was held by Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and so on, and in fact probably by most of the leading thinkers since, is no, the materialistic view is not enough. There's transcendence. There is a universe, but there is something transcendent. And from mm -hmm. where I sit, there is God. And these views come up and they clash. Now, the important thing is this. There are scientists on both sides. And the very fact that you get, let's go up to the very top of science. Stephen Hawking, the best mm -hmm. known scientist in the world, probably the physicist in the, in the wheelchair. He is an atheist. Well, Think of William Phillips of the United States, won the Nobel Prize for Physics. He is a Christian. Now, the very fact that those two people exist shows you mm -hmm. that the science versus God caricature is false. Mm -hmm. It's much deeper. It's a worldview question. And the real issue is this. Granted that these two worldviews tend to dominate the academy, and the most dominant one at the moment in the West is materialism. Where does science best fit? And Dawkins wants to argue it best fits with atheism. I want to argue the exact opposite. It best fits with theism, which mm -hmm. is where modern science started. What sort of approach do you take in your debates with Dawkins or other new atheists? Well, it, it varies with the question being asked, but the, the big issue at the moment seems to me that these people face the general public with you must choose between science and God. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be regarded as intellectually respectable, an intelligent citizen of the 21st century, you've got to choose science. Now, it seemed to me for a long time that the basic problem there was with their, a misconception of science, actually. But I'm convinced it's more than that now. And I see it as two major problems. Firstly, it's a misconception of God. You see, when I'm talking to my atheist friends, and I use the word God, and they use the word God, it has slowly dawned on me that they don't mean the same thing. We don't mean the same thing. What they mean by God is, they hold that I believe in a God of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing about that is this. If you define God as a God of the gaps, you know, the Greeks believed that lightning and thunder were the voice of the gods, they were angry. Do a bit of atmospheric physics mm -hmm. and that kind of God disappears. Yeah. So more science, less God, by definition. Mm -hmm. Now what has dawned upon me is that that is why they offer the public the choice, because they believe that we believe in a God of the gaps. So they're going to say, of course it's science versus God. But I've never met an mm -hmm. intelligent Christian, or indeed, anyone from the major monotheistic faiths that believes that. We believe that God is the God of the whole show, the bits we mm -hmm. do understand and the bits we don't. So there's a problem with God, but that actual statement helps me to go to the other side. God or science. We're now talking about explanation. And I'm a scientist. I believe that science explains. But at what level does it explain? Mm -hmm. You know the old story of the kettle. Why is the kettle boiling? Well, because the water's reached 100 degrees centigrade. No, that's not a reason. The reason is I want a cup of tea. 
Now, <laughs> those two explanations don't contradict each other. One is a scientific explanation, the other is an agent explanation. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to our old friend Newton, who after all was one of the most towering of scientists who ever lived, when he discovered his law of gravitation, he didn't say, wonderful, now I've got a law, I don't need God. No. What he did was to write the Principia Mathematica, including his laws of motion and all sorts of other brilliant things, and expressed at the front of it the desire that it might convince the thinking person to believe in God. He didn't make the mistake that Dawkins makes, Hitchens makes, and all the rest of them make to confuse law and mechanism on the one hand with agency on the other. And just because we've discovered a mechanism or a law is not an argument against the existence of an agent who designed that mm -hmm. mechanism and who upholds those laws. And th the point is, the more Newton understood of the laws of nature, the more he admired the genius of God. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Painting. The more I know about painting, the more I understand the genius of a Rembrandt or a Picasso, not the less. Can science understand the processes that we call freedom or say love? Well, is it purely chemical or is it, and then of course, faith in God itself. In other words, science deals with processes, but can it provide the explanation for all well, of life a, as they this say? This is a most important area. You see, I was never taught at school that Newton's law of gravity didn't tell us what gravity was. It doesn't explain gravity at all. It simply gives you a mathematical way of calculating the effect of gravity, but it doesn't tell you what gravity is. Mm -hmm. And Wittgenstein, the great philosopher, said the great delusion of modernism is that the laws of nature are explanations for the phenomena of nature. They don't. So that immediately tells you that science is limited. That's step one. Mm -hmm. But step two is the point that you've made. And that is, uh, Einstein was clever enough to see it. He once said, you can speak about the ethical foundations of science, but you can't speak of the scientific foundations of ethics. Mm -hmm. And what we're dealing with, and this relates to what I was saying earlier, the real essence of scientific fundamentalism today is that, and Hitchens made no bones about it, Peter Atkins, the professor of physical chemistry here in Oxford, says, science is the only way to truth. Mm -hmm. Now, that is a fundamentalistic attitude. It's called scientism. Mm -hmm. And one of the great characters in Oxford, brilliant Nobel Prize winning scientist, was Sir Peter Medawar. And he wrote a brilliant little book called Advice for a Young Scientist. And in it, he says this. He says, it's very easy to see that science is limited. And we do science no service at all in pretending it can answer every question. Mm -hmm. He said, look, take the simple questions of a child. Where, where do I come from? Where am I going? What is the meaning of life? It can't face those questions. And I mean, if you step back, this University of Oxford would have to shut half its faculties mm -hmm. if science is the only way to truth. And you're absolutely right. It cannot deal with ethics. Um, it cannot deal with these fundamental things. Yet, from the point of view of a materialist, it's got to be able to. Great scientists like John Polkingholm talk about the Christian faith as a warranted belief. John Polkinghorne actually taught me at Cambridge, and, and his books have helped me a lot. And it's absolutely right. You see, one of the clever things in the, in the new atheist strategy is to redefine faith. Most of us understand what faith is, especially after the financial crisis. We thought we could have faith in certain financial institutions. They collapsed, the markets froze, and they didn't begin to rise again until faith was recovered on mm -hmm. the basis of some evidence. So there's nobody in the Western world that does not understand what evidence-based faith is. We all know who we trust and why we trust them. But what the new atheists have done is to say faith is a religious word, firstly, and secondly, it means believing where there's no evidence. Now, there's no evidence whatsoever that that is a reasonable definition of faith. Look up the Oxford English Dictionary and you read words like the one you use, like warrant, like trust, 
and so on and so forth. Now, what they've done is clever, and it's led to massive confusion, because they think that a Christian is a person, by definition, who believes without evidence. Now, it's very important to go straight to the New Testament to clear that up, because mm -hmm. let's see what Christianity itself claims. After all, that's a reasonable attitude. And for instance, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, towards the end, John says, Jesus did many other signs that are not written in this book, but these are written in order that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and not believing you might have life in his name. In other words, here's the evidence. This is a whole book mm -hmm. full of evidence. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say into that is, look, there are these worldviews. They are belief systems. Atheism is a belief system. Christianity is a belief system. So let's not pretend they're not belief systems, but what is the evidence? Mm -hmm. What's the evidence for your atheism? What's the evidence mm -hmm. for the Christian faith? And my faith as a Christian is firmly based on evidence, otherwise I wouldn't be interested. Now here's the key thing. What has happened with the new atheist assault is they've confused people into thinking, A, that science is the only way to truth, and B, that science is coextensive with rationality. Mm -hmm. That's absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. There are the real challenging discussions between, say, naturalistic understandings and a Christian understanding. How do you approach the challenge they raise of miracles? Yes, I, I, I do have to face that directly, but there again, <laughs> there again it seems to me that a lot can be said. That the, the basic idea, of course, goes back to David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, and they all quote him. Hume said that miracles are violations of the laws of nature. We know the laws of nature. In the primitive pre-scientific times, the New Testament people could believe in miracles all over the place. This is now impossible to us. And I meet many people who are very interested in evidence of God's intelligence and the laws of the universe and so on, but they come down and say, look, Christianity, forget it, because after all, uh, central to your faith in God is, is a miracle, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And Hume showed long since, as Hitchens put it to me, that these are impossible. Well, my argument to that is Hume showed no such thing. The idea that miracles are a violation of the laws of nature is ironic for a man like Hume, who didn't even believe in the law of cause and effect on which the laws of nature are based. Now, that's a philosophical point. And it's very interesting because the world expert on Hume was Anthony Flew, the philosopher, and I had the opportunity to interview him some time before he died not long ago, and he said he was just wrong about Hume, completely wrong about Hume. He said all my books would have to be rewritten. Now, what's and the Flew, basic issue? Flew, of course, issue? became a theist. He became a, a he deist, actually, as he did. That's mm -hmm. absolutely right. And he became a deist, oddly enough, because of the complexity of the DNA molecule as evidence of intelligence. But to come to the point, why was Hume wrong? It's, well, again, Lewis is brilliant on this. Uh, and, you know, suppose I'm staying in a hotel and I put $100 tonight in my drawer, buy my bed, another $100 tomorrow night. So that's $200. One-on-one -on -one makes two, you see. Now, if on the third morning I find $50 in my drawer, what do I conclude? That the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of the United States? <laughs> well, of course, I conclude that the laws of the United States have been broken. A thief has put his hand in. He hasn't broken the laws of arithmetic. In fact, the only way I can tell that the thief has been active is by believing the laws of arithmetic. And Lewis makes this point very well. He says, look, he said, the people in the New Testament days knew as well as we did certain basic facts, like where babies come from. So when Mary turns up with a story of the Holy Spirit and angels, her betrothed husband, Joseph, says, no, I don't believe that. It wasn't because he was a pre-scientific ignoramus. He knew exactly where they came from, and it took a lot of persuasion that God directly intervened. But the point is made. The man born blind in John chapter 9, he knew that people born blind don't get their sight. He said, look to the Pharisees around him. It's never been heard since the history of the world began that a person 
born blind mm-hmm. got their sight. They knew the laws in those days. Of course they did. But the point is that as a Christian, I don't dispute the laws. They, but what are those laws? Mm-hmm. They're not causes. Newton's laws never caused a billiard ball to move in the history of the universe. People were accused of that. They describe what normally happens. But they don't put God in a prison. The God who created the universe that operates normally according to those laws is perfectly free to feed a new event and doesn't break any laws. Mm -hmm. The laws take over. It's a new event. Let me put that another way finally. If Christians were saying that Jesus rose from the dead by some natural process, then it would break the laws of nature. But they're not. Mm -hmm. They're claiming that God injected his power from outside. Mm -hmm. And the nub of the thing is this. Is this universe a closed system or isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I don't believe it's a closed system. It's an open system. It operates on the basis of cause and effect, but it has a creator who created and sustains it, who can feed events in. So I think that Hume was wrong and Lewis was right. So that the miracles of the type that are mentioned in the New Testament, it's important to say that because I don't accept all claims for miracles. We've got to test them on the basis of the evidence. They're not violations of the laws of nature. They're the lawgiver doing something that we could only recognize provided we knew the norm. If we didn't have the regularities, if you didn't know that dead bodies normally remain dead, you wouldn't be surprised Mm -hmm. at a resurrection. Mm -hmm. Uh, The reason I believe in the resurrection is partly because I see no conflict with science, but secondly, because there's historical evidence. Now, Mm -hmm. that's not scientific in that sense, Mm -hmm. unless you count history as a science, but it's rational. How would you state a proper understanding of a relationship between science and faith? Well, what I would say is what I was emphasizing earlier, to be clear on the fact that true science doesn't compete against God. What we're doing is uncovering, thinking God's thoughts after him. And the right attitude is that one's wonder should increase the more you understand of the immense complexities of nature as science has uncovered them. But we need to be aware that there's a philosophical agenda. And one of the difficulties for the ordinary person is to see where the science ends and the philosophy begins. Mm -hmm. Because when a scientist suddenly asserts, well, of course, there is no God, that's simply an assertion. That's, That's what they believe. But when they don't back it up with any evidence, I often say to people, beware of this that not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of inspection will show you that some people are very long on assertion and very short Mm -hmm. on argument. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to fear science. And and, uh, as I said, an explanation of a mechanism or or a law does not compete or Mm -hmm. conflict with an explanation in terms of an agent. All we're doing is uncovering how the agent did it, what he did, and so on and so forth. So we should be worshiping God. And also, we should remember that not all the evidence for God, of course, comes out of science. How does science touch your faith today, quite apart from debating with atheists? Well, it, it's simply, it's a very simple thing that the more I discover of the intricate structure of the universe, the more I admire the God that did it that way. But what it's done for me is I was always interested, not simply in the narrow thing that I did, but where mathematics fitted in science and where science fitted in the big picture. And it's that big picture, the Mm -hmm. intersection where theology, if you like, and science and philosophy meet And I find that immensely satisfying because the more I explore, the more everything fits together. And it comes back to the center that when I look at these worldviews, for instance, you can caricature them slightly by saying that the atheist worldview says something like, in the beginning were the particles, and the particles formed a universe, the universe formed worlds which formed human beings, which formed minds, which formed the idea of God, because there isn't a God. And the other worldview is, in the beginning was the Word. 
all things came to be through him. And that statement at the beginning of John, in the beginning was the word, for me is the most resonant thing as a scientist. Because I see all around the universe evidences of the word, the law-like structure of nature, in the code and DNA, if you like. All of those things converge to support the central picture that I've also gained by experience of God and his presence and his guidance and his mm -hmm. leading. And of course, those are even bigger things, mm -hmm. but it all fits together as one picture. Our time in Oxford has shown that the debate between science and God, or the two views of science, will continue. The issue is vital, and we hope people make an informed choice, because the alternatives lead to a radically different view of the world and radically different destinies.